Aaron Evans. Aaron. Evans. There we go. He's coming up here. Hi, I'm Aaron. Um, I signed up about five minutes ago and Dave said I wouldn't have to go first, but, uh, <laughs> but he lied. And, and, and the first shall be last or something like that. But anyway, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a test consultant. I work with a variety of companies, uh, um, either building automation or detangling uh, their automation. Um, and um, I've, I've really enjoyed the conference so far. Everyone else? Yeah. So I, I, I just had a couple of thoughts, and, um, and I wrote them down and thought I would I'd uh, say them out loud just for fun. Um, what really struck me and made me want to write was I was listening to Denali talk about uh, continuous integration. And, um, and the slide that I loved was uh, almost everyone uses Jenkins. And absolutely no one likes it. And I thought, there's, there's a product opportunity there. And, and why is that? Has anyone used other continuous integration beside Jenkins. Go ahead. You wrote your own. All right. Because what, what is continuous integration other than a cron job uh, and pulling GitHub or whatever, right? Um, yeah, right. Um, but so um, the, the issues that I saw were that it, um, speed is lacking, stability is lacking. Um, and, and then the other theme I really liked here was, was uh, the containerization and virtualization, uh, the Docker presentations. And so that's, that's a solved technical problem. We can, we can build up to scale the, the hardware we need thanks to Amazon and, and other services or, or we can build it internally with Docker or Vagrant or whatever we need. But what, what's missing from the technical solution um, uh, there's kind of an organizational issue that, uh, has anyone used manual testing tools like Quality Center, or I'm, I'm not going to name anyone who's a vendor over there next to Sauce Labs, but uh, to, tools that track requirements in manual test cases, pass, fail, pass, fail, spreadsheets, right? Um, why do managers love those things? They love pie charts, right? Investors love line charts and we all love a good Venn diagram, but the, the ability to do analytics on your testing and to be able to do it at scale, to be able to con do continuous integration, and I think that's what's going to be the future is, is we need a dashboard that can test our different environments and, and go through that pipeline stage of continuous delivery and deployment to say, yes, we passed our unit tests, now we're ready to create our package and deploy. And now we're ready to deploy to our test environment where we can do automation, where we can do manual testing. And then we're ready to stage in a production-like environment and do A-B testing, let a few customers. Uh, LinkedIn does a really good job of this and Netflix and some other companies, Amazon also, being able to turn on 1%. Um, and if you only have 100 customers, that's one customer, but uh, be able to test a small amount in production against production data and let real users use it and if it fails be able to roll back. I think that's a key and, and I'd like to see uh, that type of dashboard going forward and the tools that allow us to scale our continuous integration and to get our analytics that allows us to better improve because it, it'd be nice to be green all the time but uh, it ain't easy being green. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. All right, we got here uh, John, John, John Jansen. Yeah, John Jansen. All right, pass me that. I'm the John Jansen um, on Twitter. Originally, that was meant to be ironic because I had two followers. I, I now realize it just makes me sound like a dick, but <laughs> I am the John Jansen. Um, follow me, and um, I work for Microsoft. So I have a very thick skin. 
and I don't know, yes, yes, I don't want to, that'd be awesome if I got like an internal only email I was doing this. So this is really interesting because I see no, no text on the page. It's like, it's like there's a bug in Edge. This is the Microsoft Edge browser. Okay. That's, this is going to be awesome. If this, hold on, if this works in Chrome, I am really going to be pissed off. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> yeah. So, one, one thing that I've learned over the last year is that it's really, really hard to ship a browser. Let me just, hold on, let me just go back up. Please, where's, I just get it. Hold on. Are you serious? Like, it's just, that's so fucked up. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Okay, back to the beginning. So this is a lightning talk, so I'm already out of time. Um, but uh, I've been on the Microsoft Edge team, well, we started the Edge team about a year ago, but um, I've been on the IE team for six years. Um, before that, I worked in Office. I was a test lead for uh, the original implementation of SharePoint, and most of our JavaScript was working around bugs in Internet Explorer. It was before Chrome came out, um, so it was really Internet Explorer and, and Firefox 3.6. Um, I decided that I was sick of working around all those bugs and decided to move to the team that was causing all those bugs. And so uh, I started working on, I, started, I went over there and started working on IE9. And now I've been uh, trying to make the browser better, um, actively engaged in the W3C and standards and spent the last year basically on the Microsoft Edge project implementing WebKit prefixes. That's a lot of what we did. Um, we implemented a whole bunch of interoperable stuff, and basically the bugs that we get are from our customers saying, hey, I can't, is that not a top secret email? I just said I'm private. That's a top secret, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a whole bunch of people tweeting. Um, I said yes when it said, don't send me notifications. This is last night's build of uh, Windows, so I think there might be a bug there too. But um, we, get, we get bugs reported to us from internal customers from Windows Insiders that say, like, you can't post a comment in Facebook or you can't tag somebody in Facebook, something like that. And yeah, it's always broken. That's actually a great example for me. Um, every time we come up with a new build, you can't tag somebody in Facebook. It's very, very fragile code, I think, on Facebook's part. Um, <laughs> back it, back it. it inside of Microsoft were like, so this must be an intern's code that got copy and pasted all throughout Facebook because this just sucks. But um, that's not actually true. But what we realized was that the reason we were getting those bugs is because Facebook itself wasn't really testing our browser, right? Um, we talk to Facebook all the time. I talk to Google all the time. There's actually a couple of really good bugs in Google Docs right now inside of Windows 10 on the Edge browser. And we talk to them about weekly, but those bugs, the response we get is, oh yeah, we, didn't, we, couldn't run your, we couldn't run our automation. We couldn't do our automation. What the hell? Can I just turn it off? <laughs> like, stop it. I'm just gonna do it. I don't know. I don't even know. All right, forget it. Just don't look at the screen anymore. So anyway, um, what, you should, what you should all do now is just start tagging me and saying like the meanest, dirtiest stuff. This, I was actually, um, my, first, my first trip to the W3C, see, I, I can't do lightning talks. You put a microphone in front of me, and I do not shut up, so I'm going to need somebody to tell me. But um, my first trip to a W3C conference, I got called a fucker on Twitter. Sorry about that. Not suitable for work. I should have, I should have prefaced that with this next word is not suitable for work. But on Twitter, man, my first day at the W3C, and some guy from Google called me a fucker. <laughs> um, uh, actually, it was because I was kind of being a dick. Um, Microsoft has changed a lot since that. That was about five years ago. Um, much more open, much more communicative, uh, much more interested in getting web developer feedback on your sites, much more interested in having you guys run tests in our browser and tell us when we're broken instead of us saying, hey, just work around it. We've tried to obfuscate our user agent string so that you can't work around it as easily. Um, if you did work around it by checking if 
it has IE in the user agent string. That won't work anymore because IE is not user agent string anymore. Um, so we're working hard with the, with the public. Is that my timer? You're fucking kidding me. All right. So just, you know, it's important that you guys test in the browser. <laughs> and this is the, this is a really important slide. Um, at the John Jansen, give me bugs and run your tests in Edge. Thank you. You guys see it? Hi guys, uh, I'm David Lufton from, uh, from Salesforce. I'm a lead developer working, used to work actually on uh, test infrastructure, now kind of moved on to other things. I don't know why it's a coincidence, a lot of people talked about the analytics today and yesterday, uh, so I'm going to talk about it as well. But maybe I'll be a little bit more technical and actually show you how to do it. So really, I guess everybody is interested to know, you know, which tests are flaky, you know, which are the good tests that have good regression finding power and not just the, the useless tests that either pass all the time or don't do anything. Uh, you want to see performance aggregation. Uh, you want to also see if there's a difference between browsers and all those. So really, analytics is the way to go. So I'm going to... Uh, for uh, how to, how to uh, you know, upload your test results, how to get insight into it. So here's what I did two years ago. Um, it's, I think it's pretty common. I, I heard, I think I, somebody mentioned MongoDB today, and last time I was at the Selenium conference, I think it was two, three, four years ago, also people talked about it. So I'm sure people do that all the time. So what do you do with MongoDB? You really, you just um, um, hook onto your after suite or after class, depending if you use test in G or, or JUnit, right? Uh, by the time you're at this point, you already have the XML. Simply convert it into JSON, you upload it to Mongo. Now, this is really easy, that, but the problem is, how do you view the data? How do you get a dashboard? That's why I really don't like the, 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 this approach. So yeah, you can get the data quite easily, I'm going to show you the code pretty, well, you can see there is an after, su after suite here. Uh, I wrote a small Mongo manager that, uh, that can convert basically an XML uh, into a Mongo document and then uh, upload it, right? So then basically on your base suite, you, uh, you just upload it on your, um, uh, you know, upload to Mongo. Uh, with the simple Node.js, I, I didn't, I, I'm not going to share the code with everybody, with the whole world, until I get some approval from where I work, but I think I will be there and I, I could show you, I, I, I could do that in a few weeks, hopefully. Uh, so again, with the, with the Node.js side, uh, you're basically, the, 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 the data is over there, right? You, you, you're creating your routers and you basically uh, get the, the, the back end to, to return whatever, whatever you want. And because we're using Express and Jade, you can have nice views for, uh, for tests, for, um, for stats, everything you want. Anyway, so that was what we used to do two years ago. It's hard, right? Not uploading the data, but just you know, creating the dashboard. So there's a better way and I really recommend it is to use a, a proper analytics platform. I suppose you have <laughs> Yeah, we have at Salesforce, but there are tons of them. I, I, I did a, a quick Google search, and, and I think that it's quite a standard today to use a CSV, the CSV format. So what we're creating with the CSV is, is, um, is really a schema, right? It takes the headers, uh, the field names and creates a, a schema every time you upload a data set, it, and it, it adds more uh, rows into your data set. So we're using at Salesforce, we're using Wave. Uh, you could use others, but what's nice about it, you upload the data 
And then you just can play with the analytics tools to create dashboard lenses, and, uh, and it's, it's quite nice. So if we take this approach, and again, that's what I recommend, uh, if you go down the, the, the test and G route, uh, you create a, there's the I reporter listener, which if you override uh, the generate report, uh, it, will, um, it will create a nice report for you, a CSV report. Then you just simply upload the, the CSV to your analytics platform, and then you can get really nice uh, graphs. Um, where is it? I have... Uh, yeah, tons of graphs you can create. Uh, I don't, I'm sure I don't have a lot of time, so just uh, to... to to finish, um, yeah, oh, we also use the same approach to upload the Jenkins build stats into Wave. Uh, you can use um, a client that's existing over there, which is really nice. Anyway, thanks for uh, listening. It works. So let me introduce myself. Oh, I'm sorry, no time for introduction. So <laughs> when I was thinking about creating my own tool for page object generation, and yes, there should be the person in this conference who will be talking about page object generation. That's me, obviously. So I was really inspired by Exosuits. The tool should be the same as the exit suit itself. So just imagine the tool that makes you so much powerful that you can lift any heavy thing with this exit suit. You can smash aliens' heads with exit suits. This is all. You can fly if you want a jetpack, but who cares? So uh, this is how the tool should look like. And I was really inspired to create the tool that will use your brain, brain power that you can control fully control in order to create new page objects. And your company pays you because you are the smartest. I repeat, your company pays you because you are the smartest. So let's put your brain power into the tool and, well, let's record some page objects in a few seconds. I was so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so let me talk about the tool itself. So as you can see, it's like a simple desktop Windows application. It's built on top of the web driver, so we need to start web browser from this tool. And well, today we are going to automate 3048 game and record some elements. So after you start the browser, you can go to the locator, locator stuff and start creating your new page object. Here's your page object class name and file name. You can use Web Element Explorer in order to, well, start recording the web elements inside the web browser. And so this is a, like a special JavaScript inside the Firefox. And when you find and add new web element to the application, just add button, it will pass it through inside the desktop application. So we have this connection between web browser and thank you for, for this, by the way, to Selenium web driver and the desktop application. So uh, here we will record two more buttons, like button new will be important for our page object, and the main game board also is important element we are going to interacting with. Well, now you have this ugly XPath locators, but now inside the application you can test these locators. And well, you can see these elements inside the DOM tree also inside the application. You can highlight well, the element you have recorded, and here is the DOM tree inside, and also you can change the locator type and test new locators. So for instance here, I don't like this XPath, and I'm going to go with the CSS. Well, now you can generate page object on different languages, C Sharp, Java, Ruby is supported. Here is a Java, uh, here is a, I'm sorry, C Sharp example, with all these elements and the names, uh, beautiful names that you have recorded while you're using Web Element Explorer with all this express locator. So it's ready to use C Sharp page objects from the 
that you have record had recorded. And well, I'm supporting many languages here. Ruby is also supporting, and you see, this is Ruby and page of your game. You see how beautiful it is, H1, so it's, it's just beautiful. Let's play with this recorded elements. So let's automate this game. Let's play this game. So here's a simple script that use some kind of very simple strategy to uh, win the game. I'm not going to win this game. Just kidding. <laughs> so let's run the script from the web playground. And you see, this is WebDriver playing the game, and we achieved really good results. And this is not the end, still not the end. So, uh, well, I think the most part of this, I think, I hope uh, I had inspired you to create your own open source tool and solve the real, the real world problem. This, this tool is open source, it's free, and maybe it could inspire you to create your own tool or your pet project. And many people just say they don't have that much time to, for their open source project. So I propose to, you know, <laughs> just go and download, <laughs> grab this page recorder, <laughs> and save your time, record your page object, automate it, automate your work, and just <laughs> save some time for you, for your pet projects, <laughs> and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Knight. Uh, I work at Lifeway in Nashville. Um, we're going to cover data attributes, and what we're going to talk about. I'm missing half my half my slides here. Um, we're going to talk about data at attributes and why they're important. Um, why what we what we did to uh, move in that direction. Um, uh, obviously, we're not going to talk about data from Star Trek. But here's an example that you might see um, that you can use that kind of gives you an example. Um, the other thing is, does is the data attribute actually supported um, in my browser? And the answer is yes. Um, from this slide, you can see that um, all the modern browsers are supported um, in future releases. From my own experience, I've used it with uh, eight, uh, IE 10, no issues at all. Uh, and the reason for this is all the JavaScript, JavaScript frameworks, there's so many of them, and we know that the front-end developers are simply just swapping those things out um, about every other month uh, underneath us. And it, it's a bit of a problem. Um, so what we end up doing is using data attributes and giving a bit of a namespace and using those instead, here, here's a couple examples of um, how to do that, you know, both in CSS, XPath, and I threw one in there for uh, JavaScript. Um, one of the advantages of that is um, if for, for our team was it, it started a communication between um, our front end developer and, and the uh, engineer so that if you saw that element inside um, the uh, inside that element, if you saw the data attribute inside the element, he knew that that was being used for a test, and so he, he couldn't. So he has understanding that he cannot remove that, and he cannot just change it on the fly. He now has to communicate with me and say, "Hey, I'm going to do something with this." Um, the other advantage is that we, the other issue I have with this is that do we really want to tie our locators and couple them closely to a, a Java framework like Angular, um, like using ng click or ng hide, because sometimes that's the closest thing we get to uh, something unique in our element. And so 
that, that's kind of the issue I was facing. So we went with this, this type of uh, setup. Um, that was an, one advantage. The other is that if he does switch out his framework, it has no bearing on my test. He simply just swaps it out as long as he returns that element, puts that data attribute back in there, or doesn't change it, or does not remove it, my test will continue the pass. And if it fails, it's because his app is broke, not my test, or not my locator. Um, that's basically it. Okay. Did you have cultural issues getting them to accept the No, they help drive it to that. Um, our front end guy did not want to put IDs in because he uses IDs for his own data thing. And so uh, we, we settled on a data attribute instead. And you can go back here. It, it really helps clean up the locator as well. So. I'm sorry? No, no, I mean, really, it was, it was it, we worked together and got it done and no issues. Um, it really was around the ID, because that was one of the things I wanted. I'm like, I just put IDs everywhere I want. And he said no. So we used this instead. Any, I'm sorry? At Lifeway, I put those in. I put them, I have direct access to the source code, the front end code. So I put them in where I want them and change them and do what I need to do with them. Correct. Any other questions? Go ahead. I don't face that issue. We don't, I don't face that. So I'm not sure how you would handle that. Thanks. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I have no aliens. I just have a few people unusually very happy, but um, that's all I have. But my name is Sandeep, and I work for ZipRecruiter. Um, I just thought I'll share my experience today about utilizing a tool called Behave, uh, which is a behavior-driven development tool for Python. So I thought I'll just you know, go over some things that I learned uh, utilizing it and why I even chose that tool in particular. So uh, when I first started off, I always liked to look at any challenge uh, in terms of a Western movie. So I, I felt that there were three parts to this. First was uh, the beginning. You know, somebody had to give me the money to work. So um, you, know, you start off with that. Then you have the good, the bad, and the ugly when you try to actually utilize the tool and then figure out the uh, negatives and advantages of it. And um, the last bit is just looking ahead as to um, why that tool was, or why did I even choose Behave, and uh, what's coming up. Uh, so one of the first ground rules that I had, which I think everyone probably goes through, is do not slow down development at any cost. Uh, we tend to add automation. We tend to have, add features uh, to automate against. But the general rule of thumb is we don't want to slow down any kind of uh, release of features, because we, we deploy every day. So that means we cannot have. Uh, test that run for more than three hours. Uh, we also wanted visibility across organization. Uh, and also, we felt that uh, our, our environment was such that there was a shared sense of responsibility, uh, not just that the QA team was working by itself. 
Uh, everybody was involved in, in finding bugs or fixing them. So those were the ground rules laid out to me, and then everything else was up to me to figure out what tools we needed. Uh, I came from a background where utilizing Nose, Python, and Selenium. I was comfortable with that. Uh, but then some of my colleagues inspired me to, you know, to look at behavior type of development as to why not use this. Uh, it probably makes sense for us given the set of ground rules that were given to me. All right, so, you know, I'd, I'd, I decided to take it to heart and put it to use. And uh, one of the good things was when I came in, uh, the product managers and manual QA that we already have have an excellent understanding of the product. And I, was, I came in late to actually add in the automation. So you know, there were already features built. It's not like I was building for the future. These were existing, pre-existing features that needed, needed to be automated. So I thought the best thing to do was to utilize Behave because they could you know, write the features. Uh, they had a very good understanding of it. And I wanted to technically just reduce the amount of work I had. So I was trying to give them you know, the, uh, the workload. And the way we did it was uh, I utilized as many preconceived classes and, and functions so that they could easily write uh, all, all, most of the test cases. And it gave them a sense of independence as well. Uh, to be able to write uh, test cases by themselves. Um, one of the negatives, wa negatives of using this was there was no out-of-the-box parallelization. I think it's imperative now when you have to run these tests quick. Um, so uh, we had to build something in-house to, uh, to run it in parallel. And uh, the last bit is I think sometimes you tend to think of it as an end-to-end -end testing tool. And the, the challenge is basically to try and break it down into smaller uh, test cases to be able to, not only, not only to be able to run it fast, but also be able to pinpoint uh, certain areas where, which can be problematic. So looking ahead, I think a lot of them spoke about having, uh, having a dashboard uh, and to be able to utilize the analytics out of it. Uh, I think it would be really cool to have uh, an open source version of it where it's standardized so that everybody, you know, you have a UI tool based on what's in your database. Uh, you could actually display anything that, that your tests are actually saving. So, you know, I, mine could have the execution time, each st the amount of time that it takes for each feature to run. So all those things could easily be standardized, which I'm working on right now. And also looking at ways to uh, simplify the assertion errors. A lot of times if an element is not found, uh, you know, you just see, you as a QA engineer probably understand it. But what if somebody else from the organization was looking at these failures? Uh, how do you actually easily wrap these assertion er errors uh, so that it's nice and easily readable? Uh, so that's something that I'm working on. And if somebody, if, you know, if somebody can help me out, uh, if anybody has used Behave or Cucumber, uh, any of those tools, I'm trying to see how I could actually use conditionals within those feature statements. Uh, because you know, one of the issues is that for example, the display might change from, from a desktop to mobile. Uh, certain elements might not be present on mobile, but I want to have a conditional statement within it, uh, which I haven't really figured out how to do it cleanly uh, using Behave. So if anybody's using it, uh, feel, you know, please let me know, and I'd love to chat about it. So I just wanted to share, share some of my information, and uh, that's pretty much it. Good afternoon. My name is Titus Fortner. I work at The Honest Company, Jessica Alba's little uh, gig in Santa Monica. And I am right now a lead developer on the Water Project, and I am one of the new maintainers for the Ruby bindings of Selenium. Uh, I don't have any, uh, <laughs> don't have, uh, any slides or any, any fun uh, movie clips to show, unfortunately, but I uh, just wanted to share some kind of ideas that I've been thinking about, about testing. Uh, a number of the presentations I've been to this week so far have given the idea that we need to decrease the number of UI tests and increase the number of unit tests. That unit tests are faster, they're better. And I think with a lot of our testing, we don't necessarily keep in context what we're testing and what the results of those tests mean. For instance, unit tests. In my somewhat limited experience, most unit tests are either verifying your expectations or verifying the details of your implementation. So either you are saying, if the world was this way,
then my code works. And that's all of the stubbing and the mocking and the, even like some of the factories and things that you dig into the internals and put something in the database and interact with it that way. That's not real world. That's assuming. And that's okay if it works for your application and in the context, but it's something that I think a lot of people gloss over. The other issue is implementation details. If every time you make a change to your code, your tests fail, are they telling you what you need to know? Perfect world, a test passes, you know your code is good. If your test fails, you know your code is bad. The problem with testing implementation is that your code is fine, the application works just fine, but you change something and now your test is failing. Is it really useful to continue running that test every single time if it is just going to change only when you change an implementation and not give you any additional information outside of that? The other problem, and even worse, is the opposite where you are testing your expectations and so your application is actually broken. You've checked in code that makes the whole thing break, but your tests still pass because you said, assuming this, will this code work properly? And, and this is one of the issues we have. I mean, really the best way to prevent this is to test a real world system, which is what Selenium is designed to do. And so there is a push to do less Selenium and more unit testing and more integration testing, and that's well and good, but just keep in mind the trade-offs that you're making as you make those decisions. And again, they're gonna be context dependent depending on your application. Uh, I don't know, I, lots of companies are just like, okay, hey, we've got a bug, now go automate this. It's like, all right, so automating that test, is that going to give you information you actually need? Is that going to tell you more to make it worth the, the time and effort to maintain it or to change it if implementations have changed? A lot of it's just making sure that you understand what your assumptions are and what you're actually testing and what you're not needing to test. And I, I don't know, one example of that is uh, the, the Selenium code just this weekend. Um, implementing the Microsoft Edge browser. They had a, I used Edge as the string. And so I've got an RSpec test that's like, hey, if you make this call, do you get Edge as the string back? And, you know, apparently that's wrong when you send it. It worked just fine locally for me, but when you send it through the remote, uh, the remote driver, it, it expects Microsoft Edge with capitals. And so someone's like, hey, this breaks. So we update the code to fix it. Well, now the specs are failing. Does that failing spec that I'm t testing to say, hey, w when you make this call, do you return this string that I've got in this one place only? Is that a useful test? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's something to keep in mind. If your whole suite is full of those tests where the only time it's going to break is if you go into the code and change it, is it actually giving you vital information? Is it worth the time and energy to maintain it? Um, and so anyway, just some things I've been thinking about and I thought I'd uh, get up here and share them, so that's all I have. push button. PC string, that's all.
be popping up right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. Oh, it works. <laughs> okay. But it's not there. I just don't get to use my, I don't get to use my screen. <laughs> okay, uh, my name's Anthony Brown, so I'm a principal developer in test. Uh, so this is a talk called, uh, my page objects are drier than yours. Um, let me get this, there we go. Uh, so there's a few things page objects should do. Uh, you know, provide an API uh, for actions on the page, uh, what, initialize themselves, not expose web elements. I'm a believer in that. I don't know if everybody is. Uh, mostly follow the builder pattern and uh, be dry. So don't repeat yourself. Uh, this is the status quo here. Uh, so this looks like a really standard page object. I'm kind of following the builder pattern on it. Um, but, you know, kind of a lot of code, I guess. Uh, this, is, this is what I've done. A little bit less. So that's a, that's a equivalent. Um, so I can just go back and you can kind of see the differences. Um, but they're doing the same thing uh, in far less code. <laughs> um, let's see. So just to prove to you that this works, uh, so uh, I'm going to do, uh, it's just really hard when I don't have my screen and I'm like looking at this angle. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't used uh, Dave's the internet uh, before, he invented the internet. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a really good site to test your stuff. Uh, so, so what I want to do just to prove that this is working um, is uh, log in through the login page and then just to, just uh, check that this says secure area in the heading, right? So let's do that. What page am I on right there? Login page? I can hardly even see the screen. Yeah. So there's a login page, dry page objects, right? Um, there's the uh, status page. So uh, we're doing the find buys there. And uh, you, can, you can see that I'm actually returning a string immediately. I'm never uh, actually even using web elements. Well, I am, but they're kind of happening behind the scenes. Um, so, there we go. There's a test. Just uh, basically go to the internet. Um, and then I can't, even read, I can't even read my own code from here. Oh, yeah, enter username and password, hit the submit button. I got a like, slightly more verbose one here without using that kind of shortcut method in the, in the login page object, right? So that makes a little more sense. Uh, so username send key, password send key, click that button, and then, uh, and then pull that string right there and assert on it. So you can run it. You don't either one, it doesn't matter. Come on, Chrome. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, and uh, the internet's a little slow today, so uh, if you could put in a ticket to Dave. There it goes, done, worked, all right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, all, all I have to really show you, and I'll just go down here, yeah. So, yeah, I'm getting thirsty because my page objects are super dry, and uh, <laughs> uh, that's how you can get a hold of me. Usually you can find me at uh, free node selenium, uh, the tag demos, or uh, on Twitter at demos 4 bx Thanks. Well, I would like to thank all of the uh, speakers that we had today. And right, let's give them a, another round of applause for their dedication to come up here.